Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, very good to see so many of you here, and um, good evening to those online as we are streaming to, to tonight's event, which might either encourage or discourage questions from you later. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome Glenn, Glenn Ligon back here, uh, something like a month after the opening of Encounters and Collisions uh, via Venice, where uh, Glenn is participating in the Biennale. I'll, I'll show a slide of that a bit later. Um, and so great you could come back and speak with us tonight. Um, tonight will take the form of a conversation. Um, I'll begin with several questions and about the midway point, um, hand over to you um, for your contributions. There'll be roving mics. Um, Mercy and Phoebe have mics. And if you could kindly wait until they get to you um, so that everyone can hear uh, uh, the question. Um, so I'm sure you've all, you've all had a chance to see the exhibition. So uh, in a way, Glenn does not need to be introduced to you. Um, but for those of you that perhaps haven't had a longer relationship with his practice and his work, um, maybe a few words by way of introduction. Um, Glenn was born in 1960 in the Bronx, uh, lives in New York today, uh, and his uh, re emerged really as a um, in the art world in the late 80s, um, the turn of that decade, and I think is a very important figure of that generation as the 80s move into the 90s, uh, with works that um, I think the breakthrough was really a practice of wh where his work began being a practice of citation referencing other art, the work of other artists, uh, work, uh, referencing the words of, uh, of literary figures, uh, historical moments, and other elements of culture. And just to kind of accelerate uh, to uh, recent days, um, the, uh, his, his retrospective at the Whitney Museum of um, Art in 2011 was, a, I think, a very important event. And, um, you know, a uh, uh, opportunity to see, to, to um, consider this uh, very kind of complex, uh, rich practice. And I think extended uh, Glenn's audience still further. And um, two very interesting books produced alongside that exhibition. One was the uh, catalog itself. Um, the show was called Simply America. Fantastic title, I think. I like the titles that Glenn shows. Encounters <laughs> and Collisions, Some Changes, Unbecoming. Um, but also this smaller book uh, called Yourself and the World. And that book gathered together uh, writings by Glenn on other artists, together with a number of interviews he'd conducted. Mm -hmm. And Glenn's one of those quite rare artists particularly uh, as an artist with a very prominent career who invests a lot of his time thinking and indeed writing about other artists. As that suggests, writing is very important to him, as you'll be able to tell from uh, the, some of the examples of works in this exhibition. But perhaps paradoxically, when writing is in his own work, it's the words of others. So perhaps it's natural that this this exhibition should kind of come about, it almost like a kind of um, unfolding of a fan of a practice, both an art practice, a writing practice, into a range of other artistic figures, mm -hmm. cultural figures, and in the case of the catalogue, literary figures that uh, Glenn has been preoccupied with um, over the years. But if I could... Um, so that was, that was my way of introduction. And I wanted to begin maybe with a couple of points that, or questions people, I've, I've heard people, or observations people have made during the course of this exhibition being on. And the first one was um, that I think a number of people have remarked how topical the exhibition is, how it seems to address events in the present. Um, perhaps particularly so at this time with events in America, um, in Ferg with Ferguson, uh, with Baltimore. Um, but I think this is paradoxical given that the allusions you make to uh, political events are actually historical. 
they're from the past, sometimes the recent past. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if you could kind of comment on that response to the work and how you might see it as being valid or otherwise. Right. Well, um, I think it was Mark Twain that said, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Um, <laughs> and, and so often I find that uh, things that I'm thinking about to uh, sort of investigating as a sort of uh, source material for work has a kind of resonance in the present. And that interests me, you know. They're not the same, but they have a kind of rhyming quality. Um, and, um, you know, recently I was working on a body of uh, paintings that were based on Steve Reich, a composition called Come Out from 1966 that was written for benefit concert for a group of kids called the Harlem Six who were um, accused of a murder in Har Harlem in, the, in 64 and beaten by the police and denied lawyers. And, um, and um, there's an essay that was written about them by James Baldwin in 1966 called uh, Report from an Occupied Territory. And in that essay, he talks about police tactics in New York City called stop and frisk. And stop and frisk is still police tactics in New York City 50 years later. And it was amazing to me that the language was the same. The laws were the same. The, the consequences were the same. Except that we're in a different period. So uh, it's being addressed in a very different way than it was in 1966. You know? um, so rhymes. <laughs> Rhymes, but also some changes. And some changes, yes, yes. Um, but I'm always interested in, you know, maybe because, um, in a way, I'm, I'm bad with history. I forget when things happened, you know. I did an interview with a good friend, Byron Kim, who's an artist in this exhibition here. And he said, you know, we were talking about this thing that happened in San Francisco in the 40s. You know, these black soldiers who were sort of um, made to do this dangerous work at the shipyards, but they were in segregated units. Um, but you said it happened in our lifetime, but you weren't born. <laughs> no, was like, and it was very funny to hear him say that because I really thought, oh, I do think of my lifetime as being longer than my actual years, you know. Uh, which is a very odd thing to think, but it's sort of this notion of these things don't go away. So one's kind of memory, you know, or one's history goes stretches back beyond one's actual date of birth, you know. But these things have a kind of presence, you know, they're ghosts. They don't quite just go away, you know, they, they stay with you. So, so that's kind of my approach to sort of history. Past always producing the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the artists in the show are sort of dealing with that. If you look at the images that Sun Ra has produced uh, as a jazz musician, um, and, uh, you know, he's, um, what's that? You know, there he is in his uh, Egyptian robes and. Uh, but it's so interesting because he presents himself as he says he's a present sent from the ancestors, you know. But clearly, you look at the costume, and it's both Egyptian and the future, you know. He says he comes from outer space. Well, mm -hmm. better to be from outer space than you know Birmingham, Alabama, in 1950, where he was from. So I, I, I'm really interested in, in him as a figure because he does have this sense of like one's history is the future and the past, mm -hmm. you know. That there's a kind of confusion between them. Mm. You know? So he can draw from the future and draw from the past at the same time. Already you're making me jump around my I know, well show. go back, go back. <laughs> go back to America, go back to America. Okay, Where well, it all began. Back, back to America, but. <laughs> For me at least. <laughs> but from political histories mm. to art histories, mm. and I, I think another comment that's been mm. made by visitors and perhaps particularly mm. students of art or art history, is that it kind of for them it's some kind of ideal syllabus. You mm. know, you study this canon, it mm -hmm. can appear fixed, 
it's this roll call of historical figures, and particularly since 1945, with to say 1970, often mm -hmm. American figures. These people are in the exhibition, and uh, you acknowledge that. Um, but it's also opened up to mm -hmm. a number of other positions, and someone like de Kooning, an artist I know who's been long important to you, uh, is shown side by side with a contemporary, um, Beaufort Delaney, mm -hmm. uh, who was on a parallel but different trajectory and, you know, perhaps belatedly recognized. Mm -hmm. Or um, someone like Klein, I'm just thinking of the first gallery, mm -hmm. and um, not a contemporary of his, but Martin Wong from the 80s. So, um, I wonder if you could talk about, um, and, and, and I think, think what one thing that's appreciated there is the sense that as well as this being in a way a kind of realization of perhaps the canons, that the art historical canons you make in your mind or that are important to you, it's also an implied invitation to others to mm -hmm. kind of make their own in their head, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of a democratic gesture, but you know, perhaps beginning with you and how you see the canon mm -hmm. working and being expanded on here. Well, I think there, there are a couple of things going on in the exhibition in relationship to that topic. One is that, um, you know, as an artist, I have all these figures in my head and they're in cl very close proximity, but very rarely do you get to actualize that in, you know, you don't see that in museums and you don't usually get to actualize that in your exhibition practice. So this was a, a sort of you know, dream, you know, dream team way of doing that, you know, bringing together all these figures that have had an influence on me and putting them in juxtapositions that you probably would not see before. So, um, as you said, de Kooning, Franz Klein, Buford Delaney are contemporaries. You would never see them exhibitions together, uh -huh. you know, or, or at least I have not. Um, and so I wanted to make that kind of juxtaposition in the space of the show, but also, you know, in that room is a painting from a Stranger series, a series of paintings I've done using James Baldwin text. You don't have to go to all these. Films. It's upstairs. I can do it. Okay. <laughs> um, a painting using a James Baldwin text, Stranger in the Village. Well, you know, Buford Delaney and James Baldwin were great friends. They met in New York. Um, Buford Delaney was older than Baldwin. They reconnected in Paris. You know, mm -hmm. Baldwin became actually kind of Delaney's savior in his later years. And so it was interesting to me not only to have this portrait of James Baldwin in the show, because that has a direct relationship to the stranger painting that's there, but also Delaney is a figure that's sort of just coming into public view, even though he was, you know, friends with Henry Miller, friends with Jean Genet, knew all the modernists in New York, you know, but still marginalized kind of as a painter. So, and, but an important painter to me. But also I think, you know, the abstraction is there because I think in some ways Delaney thought abstraction and figuration were the same thing, you know? Um, and I wanted to sort of uh, show Very that. Very unusual position. Day. Right. And I think, actually, for me, abstraction and figuration are the same thing, too, if you think of text as a kind of figuration uh -huh. that turns towards abstraction in my paintings. Uh -huh. And so there's all of those kinds of connections are kind of there. But, you know, on the basic level, it's just kind of like, you know, Klein was working at this period, Buford Laney was working at this period. Let's, what happens if you put him together? What happens if you put him with de Kooning? You know? So in terms of the questions of the canon, I think we can start to kind of revise you know, who gets included in these constellations of artists. And, you know, uh, and that's exciting for me. You know? And, and I think you and an artist like Felix Gonzalez Torres and a number of people of your generation were um, incredibly important for, um, in terms of art that itself revises the canon, mm. that uh, refers directly to some, some templates, mm. um, which could be formal templates or you know, the use of language, which came into being in the 60s, mm -hmm. and, and then introducing difference mm -hmm. and other perspectives within that, right. uh, broadening well, the community of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of, of 
well, either artists or viewers mm -hmm. in, in, in those equations? Well, F Felix Gonzalez Torres was uh, sort of an interesting artist in that respect because he talks specifically about using these forms from you know minimalist art, but as he says, contaminating them with the social, with the political, with the historical. So it looks like a Donald Judd sculpture, or it looks like you know some minimalist work, but when you look at it, it has um, you know a list of kind of historical events, you know, uh, Watts riots, uh, Great Society program, you know, uh, as a text on this or blank piece, otherwise blank piece of paper that's a stack on the floor, or the candy piece, USA Today, and sort of, you know, kind of referencing kind of minimalist floor pieces, you know, but with the sense of participation, one can take a candy, you know. Right. Um, or the current state of America, or the, the, tabloid public opinion. Exactly, exactly. And USA Today was a tabloid. And, you know, it yeah. was a tabloid in America. Right. But it still exists, I think, too. Right, right. So, so all of those things wrapped into this thing that looks like kind of, you know, minimalism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. But also with a, a difference in the materials, too, like candies, you know. Um, Donald Judd didn't ever make any pieces with candies, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's he was a quite important figure for me, you know, thinking like, thinking through kind of how does one kind of work with these forms that we've inherited that still have a great deal of power, but also change the trajectory of them, you know, mm -hmm. up, update them in some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think think related to this question of how you open up and make introduce subjectivity. Mm -hmm. um, or different subject positions into the canon, is a sense that the exhibition has overall of being both, uh, I guess, somewhat something we recognize as part of public discourse, what museums tend to show us in terms of the lineage of what an important post-war mm -hmm. art is. Uh, but also, I, I, and, and, and so there's a sense of the collective, the public in this exhibition, but I think there's also intimacy um, as you underline in how you speak about Felix just now, you know, how the work's referring to these public historical events, um, but equally in these text pieces he'll introduce a reference to something absolutely biographical mm -hmm. and combine the two. Mm -hmm. And I think in this exhibition there, there's a sense that these are, uh, this is a much uh, a relationship between you and another individual artist in selecting that work as it is a group. And this is underscored by your contribution in the catalogue where you decided instead of writing an essay on the overall exhibition to write instead uh, seven letters to artists in the exhibition ranging from people very well known to you like Lorna Simpson to someone you didn't have the opportunity to meet like both a Delaney or Sun Ra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, well the idea behind that was um, I guess the idea behind the exhibition was, you know, wouldn't it have been great to have known Basquiat? You know, wouldn't it have been great to have known Sun Ra? And I didn't. Um, but the, the exhibition kind of addresses that. <laughs> and so in the catalog, um, rather than give the art historical read on why these things are, you know, important to my practice and blah, 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 you know, I just thought, well, let me think about it the way I actually think about it, it's like, oh my God, Basquiat was an amazing painter. You know, it's kind of hero worship in a way. And wouldn't it have been great to hang out with him, you know? And so the letter- But you I'm, did meet. We did meet, and I was and too shy to talk that. to him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and actually, ironically- And you're like the same of, age. Are we? No? I think you are. Which is ironic, because he- He did that you know, Janis sadly, Joplin 27 dead thing, though, you know? So I'm not sure if we were. Uh, 1960. Oh, really? I oh, think oh, so. OK, OK. Um, yes, so we would have been the same age. But he started showing way younger than I started showing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he had this sort of meteoric. I mean, if you think about how much work he produced in basically seven years, mm -hmm. it's an incredible, incredible, sophisticated, prolific painter. Um, who I was too shy to talk to when I met. Um, 
but my friend Lorna Simpson, who's in the exhibition, so the photo booth piece actually knew him and has a beautiful little drawing. So, so yeah, the letters are a way to kind of, you know, some of them are quite formal. You know, I write a letter, letter to Adrian Piper and I, it needed to be formal. Some of them, you know, the letter to Sun Ra is, he's dead, you know, so, but I still wrote that letter, as is Basquiat's dead, as is Beaufort Delaney's dead, but I wrote that letter in a way kind of addressing them as if they're alive, because they are kind of alive in terms of, you know, how one kind of discovers their work, of, you know, sees new things in the work. They're alive in my head as artists whose practices keep unfolding even though there's a fixed body of work. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's kind of what those letters were about. And then some were real letters. Like, I wrote to Zoe Leonard and said, I need these photographs, can you let them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> or wrote, you know, kind of practical, you but know? But the letter was a bit more than that. Yeah, the letter was a bit more than that because I wanted to also tell her, you know, through this catalog that how important her work has been to me. And then, you know, explain the decisions about what work. You know, that's one of the things in the show is that um, an artist makes, you know, Zoe Leonard's been making work since the 80s, but the pieces that I took were from the moment that I first encountered her work, which were these fashion photos. You know, photos like you saw here. And it was at the moment when I was thinking about sort of questions about representation, particularly photographic representation, and she was, this through this work was super, super useful for me to kind of think through these questions. And so it seemed to me in the space of the exhibition important to take that work mm -hmm. rather than take more recent work that's about, you know, these investigations of camera obscura, you know, which is also fantastic work, but it, it made more sense to me in the space of the show to focus on the things that I first saw. The same thing with Steve McQueen. You know, we were in a show together in London um, in uh, 94, mm -hmm. maybe? 93, I guess, 93, because this piece was in it, Bear, and it's the first time I'd seen Steve's work. And I thought, who is this madman polishing the floor 15 times? <laughs> You know, and then the video came on and I realized that it was reflected in the floor and I thought, this is the most genius thing I've ever seen, besides the film being incredible. So that was my first encounter with Steve's work and I thought, let's take that rather than later films, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So There are a few things I want to pick up on there. And mm -hmm. I think what's, what's interesting about this, this, what you've just been talking about, is we're now moving into the period from which your work emerges. Right. We were right. talking about the right. canon just now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, perhaps we could re return to um, McQueen in a moment, mm -hmm. and, and maybe the British and American context. But first off, you know, I wonder, and you were talking about Basquiat, I, I wonder how you feel about the way the 80s, and maybe your 80s, are represented in the exhibition. You know, let's say from Basquiat to Bruce Davidson, subway images mm -hmm. to artists of your generation that were uh, kind of in a way introducing a new chapter uh, in art mm -hmm. after the 80s that was maybe brought together in something like the famous Whitney Biennial 1993 mm -hmm. show that you participated in, mm -hmm. I guess Zoe Leonard and right. Lorna Simpson participated in, etc. Yeah. Well, I guess there were a couple, you know, rough areas that the exhibition is, is, is divided into. One is, you know, sort of predecessor. So that's why there's de Kooning, you know, Klein. These are the people that I studied when I was a young artist. And that's what artwork looked like to me, you mm -hmm. know. And then there are sort of roughly people of my generation, you know, Felix, uh, Zoe Leonard, uh, Lorna Simpson, who sort of, like, you know, people I grew up with. So I was looking at their work as it was being produced, you know, trying to think about my own work, producing work. And so they were kind of the, the ground, you know, the, the, the community that I was making work. Even if I didn't know them directly, they were still, you know, the, the, the imagined community that I was working within. And so it was really important in the exhibition to bring those figures in. And some of them I'm still, you know, in dialogue with Zoe and Lorna, et cetera, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, these are artists I still talk to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's, a, you know, it, this isn't an, um, an American exhibition as such, but there are a lot of American artists in it because, you know, 
partially I didn't travel very much at that period, so the, most of the work I was seeing was of that period. Or also in the 80s, um, there was a lot of maybe German expressionism, and, mm -hmm. but that, and that was exciting for, not, not German expression, German neo-expression, yeah, I don't know what you would call it, but you know, Baselitz and you know, Kiefer. Kiefer and blah, 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 all that stuff. You know, and that was exciting for five minutes, but then, um, <laughs> you know, but it didn't sustain my practice. And it, mm. you know, so these are the artists I felt like kept giving. Well, you had a slow gestation in a way. Yeah, well, because I'm not from a family, you know, my mother said the, the only artists I've ever heard of are dead, you know, so why do you want to be an artist? And she met Picasso, so I was like, well, that's okay, right? <laughs> but it just, you know, I didn't come out of a family where this was, you know, a viable thing to do. So I sort of had to, you know, for years and years, I sort of lied and said, I, well, I didn't lie, but I worked for a law firm proofreading, and that was the most exciting thing, you know. It's like, oh, they sent me to Los Angeles to deliver a piece of paper, you know, and that, that made sense, but being an artist didn't really make sense until, you know, until they realized that I was not going to be talked sense into, and I mm. was going to keep doing it, mm. you know. And yeah. And, and what about, uh, y y you did your postgraduate studies at the Whitney Independent Study uh, Program? No, they kicked me out of there, actually. Really? Yeah, I, I went for, that. it's a year-long program, and after about a semester, they're like, mm. oh, Really? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a famously uh, textual, theoretical course. Yeah, right. head-banging. Okay, <laughs> so you had a different reading list. Oh, we had an enormous reading list. No, you know. Your own. Oh yeah, I had my own reading list, but you still had to read the reading list, okay. and just I just didn't have the theoretical background to you know four part lectures on the Lacanian psychoanalytic theory. Please, mm -hmm. por favor. Um, <laughs> so it was difficult. It was difficult, and it was also you know this was the early '80s, so it was very anti-painting. I mean, this was like the Marxist-Leninist you know, training program for, you know, as uh, Andrew Fraser was there at the time, Mark Dion, very theoretically oriented artists. So right. I was making paintings in my little studio. That was just not, mm, <laughs> not the thing, you know. But, I mean, you're also becoming a conceptual artist in an expanded well, sense, yeah. and your work was, yeah, I mean, you know, it's very linked to queer theory, to post-colonial thinking. Uh, that was later, that was later. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think one of the things that was good about the Whitney program is it expanded the possibilities of what I thought artwork was, because before I was there, you know, I thought artwork was de Kooning, and after I was there, you know, there, I thought, well, artwork is all these other things. It, mm -hmm. it sort of opened up this possibility. So, you know, I was there in 85 and by the early 90s I was doing text work you know the, mm -hmm. the painting in the show is from 91 so I think in some ways that was the mm -hmm. result of having this kind of beat down at the Whitney program mm -hmm. um, in terms of you know sort of it expanded out what I thought art could be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and who I thought was making art too, mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, so it was super important. Um, a, a topic we've been addressing in the public program, or will address, I think it's mm. to come, is um, this term intersectionality, um, mm. which, which kind of means a combination of perspectives, which could, for example, be questions around race, but crossed with issues of gender, perhaps, mm -hmm. or sexuality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, it and, and, and that, I think, changed the terms of a number of debates. and. You know, so introduced, for example, or, or uh, complicated notions of gender through considering at the same time issues around black experience and perhaps vice versa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it seems to me that your um, work kind of um, richly manifests these ways of thinking and that, that you and I think a number of artists um, you've selected of your generation also um, I think are also significant in um, in opening up, um, and and there's a kind of passage in the exhibition where um, I think this is particularly the case. Um, say Lorna Simpson um, through to Zoe Leonard. Uh, if I move on, it's in the wrong place. 
you decide to position your I am a man mm -hmm. um, image uh, based on a painting you made in the late 80s, mm -hmm. but you gave it to a museum conservator to do a condition report of, as you do when you borrow an artwork at the beginning of an exhibition and then return it to a lender. Um, but here you positioned it within a kind of, um, well, a sequence of art also dealing with um, gender, mm -hmm. sexuality, with race, and the intersection of these things, right. the way the one complicates the other. And I think that, you know, th that painting that you're talking about, I Am a Man, was a painting that I did, one of the first text paintings, it was from 88, and it was based on a sign carried by striking sanitation workers in Memphis in 68, the year Martin Luther King was assassinated. It was actually the strike he'd gone to Memphis to support. And I was very fascinated by that sign, um, and so made a painting based on it. But the painting was made with enamel paint and oil paint, and it was basically falling apart from the beginning. And so it just sort of, you know, didn't do anything about that. But I knew it was an important painting, but it was also kind of deteriorating. Mm -hmm. And so in, uh, what's the date? 1997, I asked uh, a friend who's a painting conservator to collaborate with me on this piece called Condition Report, where, as you described, he did a condition report based on his knowledge of painting restoration, of what issues would be addressed if I was going to conserve that painting. And we made them into a, that, his condition report into a set of prints. And the idea for me was about, you know, kind of changing ideas about not only the literal, you know, changing of that painting, it, its aging and disintegration, but also changing ideas about the civil rights movement, our distance from one historical moment, you know, our views on one historical moment, um, how those things shift and change over time. Would it make sense to have a strike where black men carried a sign like that today? I, I think not, but did that make sense in 1968? You know, so th those kinds of questions. But, you know, when we were laying out the show, I realized, well, that piece would should go <laughs> in the room next to the representations of the civil rights movement, the Charles Moore photographs, or the Black Panthers. That's the, that's the place it should go. But what if we think about that piece as being as much about kind of our ideas about masculinity, too, a kind of fugitive, fictive, subject to change masculinity that's being documented by this condition report on this image that says I am a man, you know? And what if, what if we reread that work by putting it next to uh, Lorna Simpson, or next to Zoe Leonard, or next to uh, Lynette uh, Boake Yadim, you know, those paintings. You know, you know, Lynette's painting is of, I don't know if we have a slide of it, no. but, uh, is of, you know, she paints a painting a day, it's this character, you mm -hmm. know, um, totally invented, mm -hmm. not from sitting, you know, not from us, you know, a model, she just invents it, you know. And I love this idea of this sort of fictive masculinity mm -hmm. that just gets invented every day, basically, like mm -hmm. literally every day because she does the painting in the day. Um, next to Zoe Leonard, who is shooting at fashion photograph, you know, fashion, uh, fashion show, and clearly is not interested in the clothes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, as a sort of way of positioning the gaze differently, you know. Um, is talking about desire in, in terms of looking, you know which is different than the other photographers who are there who are talking about desire too, but desire the fused with a kind of capitalist consumption and you know, men's gaze towards women's bodies, et cetera. What does it mean for Zoe Leonard to go, to sneak into, literally, that shoot and shoot these odd off angles, you know, uh, next to Lorna Simpson's, whose photo piece is mostly representations of men from photo booth portraits, um, and a kind of interesting take on, like, what does it mean to self-represent in those photos, and then have, have those, you know, for, for those men, but also then take those photos and make this 
larger constellation of a kind of masculinity. And all of those photos, too, are about kind of migration. You know, photos, you know, I have lots of those photos in my family albums, too. They were the photos that my uncles who moved north would send back to the family down south to say, look, I'm doing okay. Mm -hmm. I've got a suit and tie on. I've made it, you know. So it's about a kind of masculinity in transit in some ways, like had to leave these conditions in the south to go north, you know. Um, so so th it's about repositioning, you know, my own work within this constellation. So that's part of what the show was doing for me as a way to think through, like, what are the other trajectories that maybe this work is about that I haven't fully explored or I let get too easily caught in one position, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in contrast with this um, uh, quite, quite uh, fixed and, and um, powered uh, image of black masculinity projected by, say, the Black Panther Party, mm -hmm. uh, which then seems uh, contradicted through a kind of accident by your Malcolm X painting, your white Malcolm X painting. Yeah, but I think also contradictive because they were contradictory. So, you know, in the section where we represent the Black Panthers, um, you know, we were having this discussion when we were curating, thinking about how to represent that in the show. And I just thought, okay, let's just focus on a figure, you know, Huey Newton, and see the way that the Panthers used his image to promote their causes and see how, you know, other photographers portrayed him. And part, partially for that, you know, that focus on Huey Newton was because he's just fine. He's really <laughs> cute. And, um, and they knew that. And the Panthers knew it. And they yeah. knew that, and they knew that. And that's why And they knew the photographers would know it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so the sort of like, you know, that desire, you know, that you have looking at photos like that is helping sell a kind of political agenda, and they're quite aware of that, you know. Um, in fact, there's a famous poster of Huey Newton sitting in the wicker chair with a gun and spear. Apparently he hated that poster, that image, but that image was everywhere. In fact, it's, I think it's in every photo we have up there. Mm -hmm. Not that I was looking for that image to be every photo, but it just realized like, oh, that was an iconic, you know, marketing tool for mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. you know. But it's also, as you say, in some ways related to Malcolm X, you know, related to like, where does the space of, you know, homosocial desire get represented in those kinds of images, you know? Could the Panthers allow for that, you know, initially? Probably not, but it's there, you know? The Malcolm X image was originally done by little kids that I gave coloring books to. And so this is some five-year-old's version. It's not Malcolm X, it's just a father image, you know, mm -hmm. that's being... Because this is a 1970s coloring book. 1970s coloring book archive. that I'm giving to kids, you know, when I did a residency at a museum in 2000, and they're coloring these images, and you tell a kid about Malcolm X, they don't care, it's just a father image to color. So this image with lipstick and rouges. But you look at that in relationship to Mao's images, you know, <laughs> it's it's coloring authority. Thing. It's it's mm -hmm. very primitive in a way. Like what's going on in there? I mean, as sophisticated as it is in Warhol's work, it's also this kind of very primal thing of like taking down authority figures. You know, kind as of well changing as, them. You it's know, an identity slippage. Right, identity slippage, and you know that's a difficult image because we have all our adult ideas about who Malcolm was and our responsibility to images. And it was a difficult image even for me to paint. Um, but when, if you think about Malcolm X, you know, at one time was considered in America the most, you know, dangerous man in America, and now he's on a postage stamp, you mm -hmm. know? So this tells Street's you that right icons, you know, our relationship to these figures changes over time. You know, mm -hmm. they get, so that's part of what that work is about. This is sort of, you know, a lot of my work, I guess, is engages in this sort of notion of the sort of distance between one moment and the next and how we negotiate that distance or how we think differently about text or images or, you mm. know. And can I, can I take you back to this image and um, the, mm. the exhibition that it was shown in that you participated in, mm -hmm. which I think was the first time you encountered McQueen's work. Right. And, 
some other British black artists mm. shown alongside mm -hmm. American artists. Mm -hmm. and Keith Piper was in that exhibition. Um, Sonia Boyce. Sonia Boyce, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was really important. It was called Mirage, and it was really my introduction to a whole generation of artists Sorry, artists and writers, you know, that's where I met Stuart Hall. That's when I first heard Kabina Mercer speak, Paul Gilroy, you know, uh, Sarat Maharaj was there. I mean, the amazing kind of boot camp experience in terms of British, you know, sort of intellectual thought, cultural studies. It was inc quite incredible, yeah. But, but maybe also a kind of cr the cross currents of thought between Europe, specifically mm -hmm. the UK, and uh, and America, maybe right. specifically New York. Mm -hmm. um, so did that kind of open up a, so Paul Gilroy introduced the idea of the Black Atlantic, right. for example, right. to, um, so how, how, what, 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 how, how did this uh, contrast to or add to the kind of ideas that you and your generation were developing in America? Well, I think, you know, for me, one of the things was um, these debates about you know, photographic representations of the black body. And that, I think, directly influenced a big piece I made on Robert Maplethorpe's photographs of black men. Um, in some ways, it's the reason why, you know, text was so important to me, is a sort of sidestep sort of questions about black representation, you know, figurative representation. Um, just, just to use text as a way to sort of you know, a different way of negotiating that. Um, but also I think that, you know, it was sort of like intellectual, as I said, intellectual boot camp. These ideas were sort of coming to America through the text being published, but we were a bit behind, you know. In 94, there was a conference at the Studio Museum in Harlem called Black Popular Culture. And a lot of these figures, you know, Stuart Hall spoke at that. And I was in the audience then, and it was amazing that people um, weren't really understanding what he was saying, because really what he was saying in that talk was uh, the end of black essentialism is mm -hmm. upon us, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, let's stop thinking of any, everything black as good, you know? <laughs> you know, as he says, I want to know your politics, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that was a hard lesson to learn, you know, uh, in, in the sort of, high multiculturalism of the mid-90s in America, you know. And did it change things? I think it did change things. I think it fragmented things in some ways. I think people felt empowered to go in different directories. I think that legacy has led to a whole uh, generation of artists who sort of tackled, you know, kind of icons in some ways, you know, had more ironic or distance relationship to notions of black culture, mm -hmm. you know, less monolithic views of it. Um, I think in some ways you could trace someone like Mark Bradford, I don't know how much he's shown in the UK, but his paintings, you know, his early paintings used um, hair care product, black hair care products as abstraction, you know, mm -hmm. and so there's a kind of detaching a kind of literalism about the sort of signs of black culture. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was super important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Stuart Hall's anthologized in the catalog. Mm -hmm. um, those of you who haven't seen it, I um, encourage you to see it. It's, it's in a shop and on sale in a shop. The catalog is much more than a catalog, uh, um, as, as well as uh, documenting the exhibition in full, but um, we invited Glenn to uh, edit an anthology of text important to him, which kind of begin more or less with Marcel Proust, but you know continue mm -hmm. to you know a text from Vassier, say. Um, so that's a whole other dimension to right. this project. Well, I think it was important to me to indicate that you know. Text is import, as important to me to make the artwork as artworks are, um, other people's artworks. And so the ground, the, you know, one of the, one of the pieces of ground that I'm standing on are all these texts, you know. And so to make 
like um, an anthology that was not at the back of the book but threaded through the book was a way to indicate that these are as important as the images of artworks that you're seeing mm -hmm. and that they kind of are all, they, they take up space in my head in the same way as the artworks do. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, maybe now's a good moment to um, open up and see if you have questions, contributions. Um, Adrian could, let's see. Uh, is it on yet? Not yet. Hello? <laughs> Goodbye. No. Other mic, maybe? Is it on yet? <laughs> That. It's, uh, oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. okay, let's try for that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm taken by the entire show, and also, like some other people in the audience, I was lucky enough to hear you on Start the Week on Radio 4 this week. Um, in terms of textual analysis, I noticed you started off, as you said, painting, almost in sort of isolation, perhaps, but you then decided to, it seems to be more, your work has grown, you've grown more towards as you say, te textual-based practice. Um, also, it seems to be another thread within this show, and also what you said, seems to be a kind of um, a critique, if you like, on what was ex the accepted canon when one came into the art world from a um, minority perspective, if you like, um, in, terms of, in terms of looking at those sorts of artists that you specifically, irrespective of where they were coming from in some ways, um, you felt really governed what you were trying to say as you found your way through it. Um, so it seemed like this conversation was one of, it didn't matter if the people were dead, as it were, you were actually having this ongoing conversation, you probably still are having it. Um, the other thing you mentioned was this risk of, uh, who is it you said was mentions the most dangerous man in the United States? Um, more recently, Chomsky, of course, has been wearing that kind of, uh, costume, because again, from a textual uh, critique of, of the situation, um, it seems that, um, that's what I like about your work, there's a kind of situationist aspect to it, mm -hmm. which, uh, which um, is a very strong critique of what's going on, and not just in the States, but what's about to happen here, I, I rather suspect, as well. I just wanted your comments on that, and whether mm -hmm. you'd like to expand on some of those ideas. Thanks. Okay. Um. I feel like I'm back of the Whitney. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's a very generous reading of the work. Um, and I think, what can I say? Um, you know, I think something I said on, on the radio um, yesterday, or was it today? What day, I mean, what day is it today? Um, <laughs> was that artists are citizens, you know, and that we as citizens have a responsibility to be engaged with the world that we find ourselves in. And the work in some ways, you know, reflects that engagement. Um, or the work actually imagines a better place. <laughs> than we are, you know, and, and so if you look at someone like Sun Ra, we looked at earlier, you know, he's utopian, you know, he's imagining a better place that he's going to take us through music to. Um, and I take that kind of seriously. Um, and, and so, and I think a lot of the other artists in the show take that seriously, and, the, and I'm drawn to those artists. Um, so it's always a sort of, um, and, and it's funny to say that because I don't know if I, I can't f keep facts in my head. So, um, you know, if someone asks me, you know, tell us the history of the Democratic Party in the last 50 years, I'm like, oh, uh, well, I think, you know, who was the president then? Well, you know, that's not, you know, that's not the way I can engage with these issues. But I'm, I'm sort of thinking about, you know, maybe in terms of what's been said about the, 
about this culture, which is maybe why I keep going back to someone like Baldwin, because he was very uh, sort of astute commentator, uh, particularly on American culture, but I think on world events and culture too. And, but he also, um, he wrote beautifully, you know, and he brought kind of all sorts of traditions into his writing. And so when I look at someone like Baldwin, I, you know, want to bring that sense of, you know, oneself in the world and how we kind of position ourselves in the world with a sense of craft and, and uh, precision. And some pieces more successful from, than others, but that's kind of my, the task I have as artist citizen. Some other hands were going up a second ago. Frank. Um, Tony Simpson from the Bertrand Russell Peace Foundation. Um, the Anxiety of Influence is another good title that you came up with. Um, in 1965, James Baldwin came to London mm -hmm. and visited Bertrand Russell. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X had been shot or been killed a few days before. And um, um, Sta uh, James Baldwin and Stokely Carmichael went on to become jurors on the Russell Tribunal on War Crimes in Vietnam. Um, when I've been going through this show, and I love the show, um, I've, I've wondered where Vietnam is in the show. And if it's not there, um, why it's not there particularly. I may have missed it. I mean, there's a lot there. But um, given that there are anniversaries at this time of Vietnam, and there's a question about how they're marked, was it, did that cross your agenda in mm. the preparation? No, because this, this show isn't about... Um, I, I would say this show's more idiosyncratic than a representation of American history. It's certainly not about that. I think the Panthers and the Civil Rights Movement are there because they're sort of one of the grounds that I grew up in. You know, those are errors I lived through. I was young then, but they were they were deeply influential. I remember relatives going on marches. I remember when Martin Luther King was assassinated. You know, I remember when Malcolm X was assassinated. The rise of the Black Panthers. So they're there as the sort of ground, and and it's true. Vietnam was certainly there as a ground too, but. Um, and it's there, if it is there, it's represented in Stephen Andrews' film, um, Dramatic Persona, which is based on archives from um, Black Star, which is a press photo. So there's a lot of images from Vietnam in that film, actually. But um, I know it's one of the things that actually we talked about when we were putting together the show, Alex and I, was um, how do you deal with the civil rights movement as this enormous thing that's only be going to be represented by a small body of work here. And we decided to just focus on one particular protest uh, by one photographer, you know, so images of Birmingham, uh, water protests, um, water cannons, you know, police shooting water cannons at nonviolent protesters by Charles Moore, those particular photographs as a way to say um, we're not going to sort of try to be comprehensive about representing histories here, and it's a more idiosyncratic take on. on. Um, but I think there are other pieces that, um, you know, deal with war maybe more obliquely. You know, I think the Nauman is actually, which is 74, I believe, mm -hmm. you know, Katie Nolan. Katie Nolan, I think deal with those image, deal more obliquely with the notion of violence and uh, social turmoil. Um, so it's there, it's there in the show, um, but not as upfront, you know, as other, maybe other errors are, you know, represented. Could we take maybe two questions? At the same time. Hands up. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Harmonized. Thank you. Um, I was interested in the when you were talking about identity slippage, mm. 
because some of us have been thinking quite a lot about how you use different selves and subjectivities in this exhibition and in, and in the book, the catalogue, because I think it is more than a catalogue. It's you know, very much a, a book. And in there, there's a real precision about it. And identity slippage doesn't have that precision for me. So I was finding it strange at that part of the discussion because slippage implies movement, it's fluid, but it's also about potentially getting lost. And I think when I'm thinking about your influences, people like Baldwin, who takes on different personae self-consciously, mm -hmm. or Ralph Ellison slipping into the breaks to look around, mm -hmm. those multiple masks, slippage made me wonder, because I w it made me wonder, do you ever feel, is there ever a risk of getting lost in the multiple selves that you inhabit and can move in and out of. But I think that's kind of our condition, you know. Um, it's natural, I think, you know. Uh, the, 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 the person I am with my family is different than the person I am with my friends, which is different than the person I am sitting here talking to an audience, you know, like we're used to that. And, um, and then I think that can be actually kind of productive, you know, I think it's interesting, you know, which is probably why I'm, all of my work is quotational in that way. It's in order to habit other people's w words or images and walk around in them. It's always been an impulse in the work. Um, and I don't know if I've really thought about it through in the terms you're quite quite in the terms you're describing, but it is an interesting thing to think about. And I think it is, you know, in some ways, I think it is productive to be lost, to be away from who one imagines oneself to be, you know, because how else does the work move forward? You know, often I find um, the breakthroughs in my work um, come by accident. You know, I'm working with a silk screener and they fuck up. And they say, oh, we can fix that. And I say, that's a better idea than the idea I had. Let's go with the, the fuck up, you know. Ooh, live stream, forgot, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, so. you know, this sort of notion of like getting away from the self, you know, one's intentionality. Um, so and unbecoming. Your title unbecoming. unbecoming, yeah, that's kind of where that title came from, you know. Um, but also I think, you know, more generally, maybe artwork is a kind of thinking process. So for me, I'm when I'm making work, I'm thinking about the subject matter. It's not like the subject matter has been digested and then I just make the work. It's so I'm sort of thinking through as I go. And so often that means you have to give up these preconceived ideas of the kind of work you make and what, you know. Um, and I find that's kind of, you know, whether that's all successful or not is another question, but I think that's what we do all the time, you know, um, in order not to be stuck in the places that we think are, you know. Because I like, as an artist, to do things I don't know how to do, to sort of try to be people I don't know how to be, you know. <laughs> um, and that's in some ways what this show is about, is kind of like I'm bringing together all these kind of different ways of making work, but they've been formed to me. They've kind of internalized, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Who's next? Over here. Hi, um, sorry, I, this might sound like a naive question. Um, uh, forgive me if it is. Um, I'm not as familiar with your work as I now want to be uh, after seeing the exhibition, which I guess is a good thing. But, um, but um, you, you kind of encounter and engage with a lot of different medium, uh, media, um, meaning that like literature seems to have um, played a great role in your um, career, in your life. Uh, paintings and all of um, the other art forms, photographs, and I'm just wondering um, what the medium or what is the place of the, a particular medium when you start working on something. Um, mm -hmm. what, 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 how do you start engaging with something and 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 decide? Well, for this one, I'm gonna do a painting mm -hmm. that takes. Uh, Baldwin's text instead of working on a text all yourself. Right, all right. Um, Fairly, I don't, there may be one or two pieces where there are texts that I've written, so the, you know, 
when I write, it's usually for something, you know, publication. Um, but I think, you know, it's trial and error. Some projects start as, I guess the default position is always painting, and then I realize this is not a painting project. And so there's a lot of trial and error there where I'm trying to force into painting something that won't go into painting. And then I realize like, oh, this is a photographic project or, or this is, uh, you know, a, a neon somehow. It's not, you know, it's not in the form that I think it should take. And, and often that um, is difficult because it sort of forces me into territory that I don't know about. You know, I've made a couple of film projects. There's one upstairs called The Death of Tom. Um, I don't know anything about film and video, really, but it seemed, you know, but it's based on a text, you know, that Uncle Tom's Cabin. And uh, I got the opportunity to do a residency where I could work with a, a video maker and we were gonna do this thing and it kind of, he was terrible and it blew out. And so that's why, you know, it's sort of all out of focus and all of that. And I decided, well, that's more my work than the idea that I had initially, so why don't I go with that? You know, but again, I don't, I don't know anything about video and film, but it's sort of interesting, to, it's, it's sparked other things. And um, so, yeah, I think often is, it's about, um, you know, the, as I said, the default position is painting, and then I have to go find if that's the right way that this thing wants to go, you know? Is there anyone else like that that has, I don't know, that comes to mind or has inspired that dualism in your work between painting and other media? Because well, it's there's something quite unique about your practice. No, really, I don't know. Is it? What do you mean? I'm trying to think of uh, other figures that are really, whose practice is half painting, half other media. Um. Anyway, we can think of them later. I know. But I, 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 no, I, mean, I, I, think I think it's one of the anything. kind of extraordinary things, and it also runs through the range of media in a show. You know, it's half painting, half other well, things. Well, because at a certain point, painting is easy and boring. You know, so you it's gotta. It's not good at some things. It's not good at doing some things. I'm, I'm, I can make a good-looking painting. That's not so hard. But then that gets boring. So I need to do these other things to get the other parts of my brain working, and then I come back to painting. And then it's a silkscreen project, and I don't, you know, I don't technically know a lot about silk. You know, and I have great silk screeners, and so, but then they make mistakes, and I was like, oh, the mistake is more interesting, you know. So let's go with that. So it's just finding a way to keep yourself interested, other than, you know, getting away from what you know how to do. You mm -hmm. know, your skills, I think, can be really interesting, and that's maybe in a way why I write too. Writing is as hard as making artworks, but it forces me to look closely at things, you know? Look at artists, you know, oh, I know David Hammond's work, but when I had to write about it, I was like, no, oh, I don't know anything. Let me really dive in there. Let me really look. And that was really helpful, you know? Um, so anyway. Well, thank you. Ooh. <laughs> maybe, maybe one more. <laughs> Just, just a small follow-up to what you said about mm -hmm. when you, the process when you're painting, when you're creating, mm -hmm. and when you're writing about painting. Mm -hmm. Do you find, uh, do you find yourself split between those two different processes? Do you feel you have to shut down your perspective and your mind as an artist in order to stand back and think about it, or do you find them mutually reinforcing? <laughs> Do you do them at the same time? Yeah, I do them at the same time. Um, you know, I just I wrote something on Chris Ophelia's work for his recent show. Uh, I wrote on, just recently wrote on uh, Lynette um, Boake Yadim's for her show, Coming Up at the Serpent Time. Um, I wrote on Agnes Martin for uh, Freeze, I think, some magazine. Um, but it's, you know, but I find it interesting because it makes me look harder, you know. So I wrote about the Agnes Martin painting I wrote about was at the Peggy Guggenheim collection in Venice. And I just stood there for an hour and I was like, okay, I'm a painter, so I know some of the tricks, you know. I know kind of how this was made. 
but then, you know, the more I stood there, the more that painting unfolded, you know, and the more I thought about, like, so how's this title? What is this title about? It's an abstract painting with a grid on, a pencil grid, but it says Rose, you know, and this woman next to me was saying, like, why is it called Rose? It's not red, you know? Cause it, and I thought, well, roses come in many colors, you know? <laughs> but Rose as in sunrise, you know, that, and I was sort of started that whole riff about, like, language in this title, you know, minimalist work from the mid-60s, but with this very evocative kind of romantic title, you know, I thought, so interesting. And everything around it is like untitled number 47, you know? So, so just actually standing there and having to like, okay, I have to write on Agnes Martin, like here's this painting, let me just think about it, was really great in a way, because it really forced a new, you know, I'd never really thought about her titles before, you know? So it sort of forced this new way of thinking about her practice in general. But, um, but yeah, that's going on while I'm in the studio making things and looking at other artists' work and looking at exhibits. So it's all of a piece, but writing is as hard as making artwork. So I try to kind of, you know, given the choice, uh, I probably should be making artworks. <laughs> <laughs> and one absolutely final question. Skinder, down here. was um, starting with the starting point of rhyme in your history. Mm. Uh, well, you know, history repeats itself by rhyming, etc. cetera. Um, and looking at the, the rhyme and reason between um, black British contexts mm. and American mm -hmm. um, black contexts. Mm -hmm. And your first encounter uh, with black British contexts was obviously quite uh, a significant moment um, how, uh, what could you expand on that mo on that moment, and also the ongoing dialogue that happens between and across the Atlantic? Mm. Well, I think it's at the moment when you know, uh, when I realised that you know, black in Britain doesn't mean the same as black in America. You know, the the, the term black here includes you know, many other people than the term black in black America. And the kind of, you know, it was an opening up of the sort of sense of like, well, how then does, you know, the sort of questions about blackness in America kind of um, in some ways circle the wagons, you know, like exclude things that maybe needs to include, you know. So it was a sort of opening up in terms of thinking about, you know, but also I think, um, you know, the sort of notion that uh, of the black Atlantic, too, to think about blackness, you know, more kind of globally rather than, um, you know, this is sort of American-centric, uh, sort of American-centric view of blackness, you know, as if the black American experience is the black experience. And so that was, you know, early 90s was a huge opening up for me, you know. So, you know, meeting artists like Keith Piper, Sonia Boyce, uh, Isaac Julian, you know, meeting the, the you know, Paul Gilroy, the theorist, uh, Cabana Mercer, et cetera. That was a huge, huge, huge uh, shift for me in terms of my thinking. And, uh, and these are, you know, artists and, and um, thinkers that I follow still and have enormous insights still that sort of inform the practice. Thanks. That's a really nice place to end. It's great Thank to you. have so, so much of Glenn on this side of the Atlantic. <laughs> uh, first off in Camden, now of course in Nottingham, um, via Venice, and, and then Liverpool, where uh, Glenn's show will be alongside um, the Jackson Pollock show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very canonical. Right. And um, so thank you all for your participation tonight, for your questions, and thank you warmly to Glenn on all our behalfs for returning to Nottingham tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Alex.